Hi, and welcome to Why Do Countries Exist, Episode 5, Andorra. So we've reached our first microstate. A microstate is pretty much any country that is hard to see on a map, which Andorra most certainly is. It is the 17th smallest country in the world and is roughly the size of three Washington DCs. Andorra is located in the Pyrenees Mountains, right on the border between Spain and France. It is another mountainous country, with it being famous for its ski resort that brings in roughly 10 million tourists to the country every year. The population of Andorra is also fairly small, with 77,000 people living in the country. However, the majority of the population don't actually hold citizenship. Only 33% of people are citizens, with the rest being a mixture of French, Spanish, Portuguese, or other countries' immigrants. I couldn't find a good answer as to why so many people don't have citizenship. However, if I had to guess, it seems like in Andorra it can be a lengthy process to get citizenship, with it taking 20 years of residence in the country and giving up your original citizenship required in order to become one. Andorans often speak four languages. Many will speak Catalan, French, and Spanish, and then they will often choose to learn either Portuguese, English, or another language. In terms of religion, 90% of Andorans are Catholic. Other religious minorities such as Protestants, Muslims, and atheists exist, although they remain small. Andorra has had humans living in its borders for 10,000 years. The Proto-Celtic Urnfield culture, whose name comes from the fact that, surprise surprise, they left a lot of urns in fields, had a very strong influence on the region during the 4000s BCE. The region became inhabited by the Iberians starting in the 7th century BCE. These Iberian tribes living in the region would become known as the Andosian, and would be famous for attacking Carthage's army during the Second Punic War in the late 200s BCE. Andorra will be placed under Roman rule after the war. Rome mostly used the region as a trading point between several cities across the Pyrenees. After Rome fell, the Germanic barbarian Visigoths would take over and bring Christianity to the region. They would rule until they were in turn destroyed by Muslim invaders in 700 CE. Andorra would never be conquered by the Muslims, but Andorra would fight to prevent them from moving into Western Europe. Legend holds that Andorra was founded at this time by Charlemagne, who promised the Andorran people protection and an armed guard because the Andorrans had aided the Franks in fighting off Moorish invaders. Now we briefly have to talk about the Catholic Church's administrative policies. Catholics are divided into several different entities known as dioceses. For example, I live in western Washington, so I live in the Archdiocese of Seattle. These dioceses are run by a bishop who helps lead the church in that area. In Andorra towards the end of the first millennium, it began to be run by the Diocese of Urgell, which still exists today with it controlling Andorra and a small part of Spain. The borders of it were based roughly around the county of Orgel, a small feudal state. However, medieval politics are complicated and messy, so the count and bishop often ended up having joint administrative status, much to the annoyance of each other. In 988, the count of Orgel decided to give full administrative control of Andorra to the bishop in exchange for some land in the east. I know all of that was probably very confusing, but bear with me. The bishop of Orgel began fearing that the count would want to take back the land of Andorra. In 1095, the bishop asked a local noble, Lord Arnal de Cabouet, for protection, and in return, Cabouet was given partial political rights to Andorra. Cabouet's descendants would eventually, in 1208, marry into the county of Foix, which was based in southern France. Foix was led at this time by Roger Bernard II, who would play an important role in the Cathar Crusade. The Cathars were a Christian movement that teached that there were two gods, a good spiritual god of the New Testament, and a bad material god of the Old Testament. They were centered in the Languedoc region of France, an area with a strong sense of independence. The Cathars held many views that went against the beliefs of the medieval church, often challenging the power that the medieval church and the pope had. This made them attractive to many local nobles who, while not as puritanical as the Cathars, were sympathetic to it. While the details of how the crusade went aren't too important, just know that the Cathars lost and strain was placed between many of the local lords and the church officials. By 1278, things had reached a boiling point between Bernard's son and the Bishop of Orgel. The two almost went to war, but the King of Aragon decided to intervene and instead set up the Peerage of Andorra. The Bishop of Orgel and the Count of Foix would both hold equal political power in the country, acting as co-princes. This agreement of equal co-princes still lasts today. The Peerage would also set up basic law in Andorra. In 1419, the General Council of the Valleys was established, acting as a legislative body for Andorra, and is uniquely the second oldest parliament in Europe. While the local male population could vote for members of parliament, it quickly came to be dominated by the wealthiest families in the country with them holding most of the power. In 1441, the Queen of the Bath Kingdom of Nerevar married the Count of Foix. This then made the King of Nerevar the new co-prince of Andorra. However, in 1512, the emerging Spanish kingdom, led by Ferdinand II, invaded Nerevar, taking the southern territories of the kingdom. The remaining northern territories would remain independent, although significantly weakened and growing closer to France. In 1589, after the disruptive French wars of religion, Henry IV of Nerevar became King of France. This turned the King of France into the new co-prince of Andorra. Andorra's unique status as a co-princedom led by two princes on opposing sides of the Pyrenees prevented most neighboring states from troubling the small state and spared most of the country from violence. A small militia was set up, but for the most part just dealt with bandits. Many Andorans found themselves strongly connected with the Catalan identity at this time, with Catalan art and literature being widely produced in the country. 
After the Nueva Planta decrees in 1716, which removed much of the autonomy Catalonia had, many Catalans fled into Andorra, and Andorra became a hotbed for Catalan nationalism. Even today, many Catalan nationalists consider Andorra to be a part of a wider Catalan community. As feudalism was being dismantled during the French Revolution in 1792, many French revolutionary leaders debated what to do with Andorra. They thought that by keeping the title co-prince, they were promoting feudalism, which went against many other Republican values. France decided in 1793 to give up their rights to Andorra. However, in 1806, the new French emperor Napoleon, after taking control of most of Europe, decided to restore the Coburn status in Andorra. Andorra would be annexed into France temporarily from 1812 to 1814, as the Napoleonic Wars came to an end. After the restoration of the Bourbon Kings to France in 1815, Andorra's French co-prince would always be whoever the head of state of France was. This oddly enough means that the president elected in France actually are also technically a monarch in a foreign country. While the world around Andorra changed, Andorra seemed unable to. It kept many of its medieval institutions, and feudalism was still prevalent in the country until the mid-19th century. In 1866, the syndic, or speaker of the General Council, Goulamin de Ramin Plantulet, pushed for new reform in Andorra that would be known as the New Reforms. These reforms would help end feudalism in the country and broke the power of the rich landowning families. Now, all voting rights were extended, although only to male heads of the household over 25. A modern economy was set up, and many of the traditional institutions of the country, such as the flag and the first constitution, were created. Unrest continued, however, as in 1881, conflict broke out across the country. While it remained small, it did deeply divide many in Andorra. Andorra would kind of participate in World War I. It declared war on Germany in 1914. However, as Andorra's army is small and largely ceremonial, Andorra didn't actually send any troops to fight in the war. The war would end in 1918, with all participants signing the Treaty of Versailles, all except Andorra. Everyone had forgotten Andorra had declared war, so Andorra was in a de jure state of war, although no one remembered it. It wouldn't be until 1958, when peace was signed between Andorra and Germany. Andorra would experience rapid change during the interwar years. Tension had continued to mount from the 1881 conflict. Spain would try to draft men from the Principality in 1929, and a riot would break out between Spanish construction workers and Andorra locals in 1931. This led radicals and nationalists in Andorra to grow more weary of foreign interference in the country. In April 1933, a mob would break into the General Council after funds from Spain were stolen by corrupt officials. The mob would be led by the labor union Jovas Andorras. It had strong anarchist tendencies and believed in universal suffrage for every citizen in the country, workers' rights, and he moved towards a more republican system. The co-princes of Andorra would be greatly disturbed by these changes, and in August, the French president, Albert Lebrun, would order a small force of 60 military police to occupy the country. While they were successful in preventing a republic of Andorra from being formed, discontent still simmered and universal suffrage was forced to be introduced. Within this politically tense environment came the most fascinating man in Andorran history, Boris Sukosirev. Sukosirev was born in the Russian Empire and is believed to be in the part of the lower nobility. A lot of his life is unclear, with him claiming various different titles, adventures, and achievements throughout his life. However, it is believed he fought in both World War I and the Russian Civil War before being forced out of Russia. Zukosyarev had moved to Andorra around 1933, and in May 1934 he would write to the General Council, asking for them to let him rule the country. While at first he was laughed off, when presented a constitution for if he were to take office, Many Andorans grew curious. Sukosirev proposed modernizing the country, building up infrastructure, ending the rule of the co-princes, giving greater workers' rights, and allowing Andorra to become a tax haven so foreign money could be brought into the country. And despite Sukosirev's eccentric personality, these ideas weren't honestly that crazy. Many of these ideas had been brought up in several other European microstates at this time, with many becoming increasingly wealthy. In early June, he was officially declared King of Andorra, with the General Council approving. Sukosirev would strangely enough declare war on the Bishop of Urgell and start making plans for a casino. The French government, for the most part, didn't care, and seemed content to let Sikosyev take over the country. The Bishop of Orgel, on the other hand, was more opposed, mainly because the bishop believed that gambling was a sin, and that Sikosyev's declaration of the kingdom was illegal. On June 20th, four Spanish police officers entered Andorra and arrested him without a fight. Sikosyev would be transferred out of the country, and while he would never visit Andorra again, he would continue to live an adventurous life before dying in 1991 in West Germany. While Andorra would domestically begin to grow more stable, international events around them began to grow more heated. In 1936, the Spanish Civil War broke out. While Andorra was never attacked, a small French military detachment would be brought into the country to protect it. Andorra would also serve as an important smuggling point both during and after the war, with anti-fascist propaganda and illegal goods being brought in from France before traveling into Spain. Spanish Republican refugees would also use Andorra as a starting point before traveling into France and the rest of Europe. At one point, it is believed there were more refugees in the country than residents. During World War II, Andorra would continue as an important smuggling route. After the fall of France in 1940, 
and the rise of the pro-German Vichy government, Andorra would serve as a place for refugees and smuggled goods to be transferred in and out of France. The Andorran government at the time decided to remain strictly neutral in the war for fear of French or Spanish invasion. The government would prevent refugees from entering the country and restricted the press. Many in Andorra would go against the government's orders and actively help French resistance and allied military personnel travel through the country. It is believed roughly 400 people were smuggled in and out of the country from 1940 to 1944. After the war, one radio station, Radio Andorra, was accused of collaboration with the Axis, which caused tensions with France, although by the mid-50s, things seemed to have been sorted out. Andorra would begin developing rapidly post-war, entering an economic boom. Tourism dramatically increased during this time, with several ski resorts being built, and Andorra would start to be used as a tax haven. In case that sounds at all familiar, that is because that is exactly what Sequoia Dad's dream for Andorra was except with him in charge, of course. The Andorran GDP increased rapidly during this time, and Andorra went from a country that very few in the world even knew existed to an important hub in mass culture. Andorra post-war, and even to a certain extent today, is living in a period known as the Andorran Dream, where the economy is relatively high, and for the most part, things are good in the country. Andorra would politically begin to modernize starting in the 80s, when the first prime minister was elected in 1982 and trade agreements were signed with the European Union and the European Economic Community, bringing Andorra closer with much of Europe. In 1993, the current constitution would be enacted after a referendum approving it was passed. This constitution legalized political parties in Andorra. Currently, Andorra is led by Xavier Espot from the center-right Democrats for Andorra party. The two co-princes currently are Bishop Juan Eric Vivis Esilia of Yorgel, and the French president, Emmanuel Macron. So why does Andorra exist? Andorra is a weird country compared to the other ones we've talked about. Andorra has not had to suffer from massive war, nor has it been the center of political empires, and yet it still exists and thrives. Andorra is an odd country and kind of shows that history isn't all about great empires, massive battles, or the big men of history. Sometimes it's just a strange guy who nobody really knows the real backstory of, asking if he can be your king. In the words of Napoleon, Andorra is a political curiosity that must be preserved. Next time, we will head south and go to Angola. Prepare for a lot of economic resources, Portuguese colonialism, war, and a very weird enclave. Thank you. My email is whydocountriesexist at gmail.com so you can send your suggestions, comments, thoughts, feelings, or hate mail. The sources I use for this video are Emperor Tiger Star's video, Why Does Andorra Exist? Geography Now's video, Andorra, The Great Wars video, Liechtenstein, San Marino, Monaco, and Andorra in World War I, History Files article, Boris Sukoryev, Mr. History's video, A Quick History of Andorra, Real Crusaders History documentary, the Abidjusian Crusade, a U.S. government's document on Andorra, Van Diagram's video, Co-Principality of Andorra Explained, The World at War's Timeline of Andorra from 1866 to 1957, and Wikipedia.